If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to Proverbs 16. We continue here in the Proverbs series, and I'm very much looking forward to this message today. Today's message is in regards to pride and also in regards to humility. And um, as we walk through this message, it is my prayer that God would do just something incredible in each of our hearts today. I want to pray before we begin our time together here in this message and also pray over the children's ministry. So if you would, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time now that we're going to spend focusing in on your words and also, Lord, uh, just listening to your voice, leaning into your spirit. We ask your grace upon this time. Father, I also pray that in the spiritual realm that, Lord, you would protect this time and that anything the enemy would want to do, Lord, that you would completely take care of that in Jesus' name. Father, we pray over our children's ministry. We ask for a blessing upon them today. Guide and lead their time together. We pray for a blessing upon the grandparents as they pray that Levitical blessing upon the kids of our children's ministry. I pray that your spirit would bless that time as well. We thank you for these things today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at one verse here in Proverbs 16, specifically in verse 18. This verse talks about pride, and perhaps you've, you've heard that famously when they say, oh, you know what? Pride comes before the fall. That would be our natural response, and that's coming from this passage. And that's not exactly what this verse says, but it is a truth regarding pride. And so you'll see as this uh, goes about, it says, pride goes before destruction. And then it says, a haughty spirit before a fall. And so one of the ways in which that we can operate in pride is when we try to do things in our own strength. How many of you have ever been in a situation and as you're going about it, you just decide to, to start fixing things only to make matters worse? Anybody with me on that? Okay. And humility would say, let's just stop and maybe ask the Lord for some guidance here, the Lord for some help. And so it's important. The Bible talks about grace being given to those who would approach him with humility. And as a pastor, I can tell you the, the many things that I might be involved in on a day in and day out basis a lot of the things that people might be struggling with, and this isn't always the case, but a lot of times the struggles in life, the struggles in a marriage, the struggles in um, decisions, sin decisions, things that people are caught up in, a lot of times the, the root source of all of that is there's a pride issue. There's a pride issue in your own life or perhaps um, in your spouse's life or a child's life or whatever. There's a pride issue. And there's grace when we humble ourselves before the Lord. And I want to read here a letter to you. Um, and you're going to see God's grace at work here uh, through this letter. It says, hello, my name is Mr. John Doe. My only goal in life was to be a good husband and a good father. In 1984, that goal became reality when I was married to my beautiful wife, Mrs. Jane Doe, and we ended up having three amazing children, two girls and one boy. On Christmas of 2021, after 38 years of marriage and of being a father, I almost lost it all. I found myself in a place where I never thought I'd be. And to give you context, for much of my life I struggled with a low self-esteem. And I masked it by working hard through climbing the corporate ladder and at times through drinking. Part of my corporate job was entertaining customers. And that often meant a free night on the town, including a lot of drinking. And it didn't seem like a big deal. It was encouraged by the company, 
to build relationships, and it was a part of the work culture. But then everything changed when I returned home extremely ill from a work trip overseas. This illness became chronic and had invaded every part of my body. And it took years to identify the illness which caused excruciating pain and a poor quality of life. Years into it, I remember overhearing my oldest daughter tell my wife that dad is dying right in front of our eyes, which one of my doctors at Mayo Clinic confirmed by giving me five months to live. Finally realizing the severity of my health and physical condition, I filed for FMLA medical leave, but then was released from my job just three days later. I felt totally betrayed by both the company and the coworkers, and this caused my self-esteem to hit an all-time low. I found myself dealing with severe depression and anxiety. I had all but given up. My wife and I were now talking about divorce after 38 years of marriage. My drinking had expanded now to day drinking and drinking hard liquor along with beer. And this all came to a head where on Christmas Eve 2021, I found myself alone in a hotel room inadvertently drinking myself to death. And I didn't care. Thankfully, my story didn't end there. There was a knock on my hotel door. It was the local sheriff doing a welfare check as my wife had called them. I went with them to the hospital to sober up. While my wife had given up on our marriage, she hadn't given up on me as a person. So I called the Hazelden Betty Ford Center in Minnesota to see if they had a vacancy, and they did. And at the hospital, it says, I knew this was it. I was clearly at a crossroads. I had two options. Either I get help or my life was going to end. I decided to take a step that I thought I'd never take, and I decided to get help. While in treatment, I realized I had hit rock bottom, and I immediately began to look for daily scriptural help at the treatment center's bookstore. And I began to read devotions from the Bible and and also pray. And one night, I felt as if God was speaking to me. It was so obvious that at that moment, I stopped, and I completely surrendered my life to God. Surely, the Lord could do better with my life than what I had done. I had long believed in God, attended church, I served, and I even prayed but I hadn't realized how much alcohol had invaded my mind and my soul. And I decided to reject alcohol and ask Jesus to fill the large void that would be left behind. That's when a new journey began. That day, that moment, everything changed. And I prayed that God would remove any cravings or triggers that I may have. And I physically felt them leave my body. My body became overcome by a calming presence. And that was just the beginning. Miraculously, the desire for another drink left me. And I started my journey of sobriety along with a group of guys who became like brothers. I am proud to say that I have been abstinent from both alcohol and opioids used for pain control for 16 straight months. I'm now a part of an amazing church, and I'm restoring my relationship with my children and my wife, who upon seeing my life change, 
decided not to follow through with the divorce. If I could encourage you today, if there can be some good that comes because of my many mistakes, my disease, my messed up priorities, it is one, and that it's never too late. Yes, I wish I had had my spiritual awakening many years ago. There's so much I regret from my past and things that I cannot change, but I can change the future, and you can too. It doesn't matter how old you are or what you have done. You can do this and start by submitting your life to Jesus and open the door of your heart to him and watch what he does in your life. Sincerely, Mr. John Doe. With the last words there from John, I want you to turn to the book of James with me, James chapter 4. With this message specifically pointed at pride and also humility, this John Doe says, you can, you can do this. God can help you in your life, but you have to start by submitting your life to Jesus and open the door of your heart to him and watch what he does. And in James chapter 4, specifically in verse 6, the Bible says that God gives us more grace. And that is why the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And then specifically in verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, show genuine repentance and a desire to be changed and transformed by God. In verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. We can get caught up in the midst of the circumstances of life, and Satan can use those circumstances and create a spiral in which we might be making decisions that we thought we'd never make. And we go to places we never thought we would go. Proverbs 11.2 says that when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. If we humble ourselves... And we say things like, God, I need help, and I cannot do this on my own. And we make difficult decisions as far as where we turn to when it's time for that help. And it might mean taking us outside of our comfort zone. But in the midst of that, I look at these scriptures and say, God shows grace to those who would humble themselves. And God uses humility, and he uses people who are willing to be vulnerable and to recognize that they need God's help, and even being willing to share their testimony. And so at this time, I would like to invite up Mr. and Mrs. John Doe. If you'd please come join me. Folks, would you welcome Bruce and Julie Maley. you guys share the mic here. So Bruce and Julie have been on quite a journey the last year and a half. And um, in the midst of that, there's been times that we've been communicating with each other and walking through this process. And um, to be able to just sit here with both of you right now is a testimony to the grace of God and the miracles that he does. When people humble themselves, you see God's grace at work. 
So um, my thought for them when uh, is kind of you moving back here um, now that you've gone through treatment, Bruce, was there's going to be a moment where you'll get to share with the congregation because you've been gone and people have been asking Julie, where's Bruce? Where's Bruce? And sometimes you don't get all the details, but you know you can be praying. And so in the midst of that, people have been praying, and they may not have known all the details. But here we are, Bruce is back, and you both are now going, okay, God, what is next for us? And a willingness to share your testimony. We were going to do this on Memorial Day weekend. And so we met on Friday, and um, this last Friday, two days ago. And when I was asking God for guidance on when this testimony should happen, I was getting April 30th. And I'm like, but that's a quick turnaround. And so, but in my mind, I thought, I think Memorial Day weekend will be good. It'll give us time to process and things like that. So we met on Friday, and I was going to talk to them about um, Memorial Day weekend. And one of the first things that Bruce tells me in my office is that if I had remained in my pride, I would not be here today. And it's because of God's grace and being willing to be vulnerable and have the humility to share this. I think essentially that's what you were telling me as we started that meeting. And I just sat there and I thought, April 30th. (laughs) As we talk about pride and humility, I think this testimony is supposed to happen today. And then we're texting back and forth since our time on Friday and um, I, you know, that letter that you had written was written for a Christmas service um, for uh, your son's church. And um, so there was some updating that I had to do. And part of that was the length of the sobriety. And so you gave me a note. You said it's now 16 months today. And I'm like, well, guess what? The message is from Proverbs 16, so how do you like that? But, you know, in the midst of that, just for the Lord to be at work orchestrating it, there's a reason why you're sharing what you're sharing. And whoever's listening, we believe it's God-ordained, and there's something that we need to hear in this. And so as we've talked, just your journey over the last year and a half or so, Um, Each of you had some moments, if you will, that you could say would be the turning points or decision points or um, even just these huge God moments. I mean, it had to be God at work and just recognizing that. And so for you, Bruce, you said the the main three was the, the time at the hospital right after the sheriff had done the welfare check. And then there was another moment where you had to make a decision left or right, and we'll get into that. And then also the moment uh, that you had in the worship center up in Minnesota. And so um, let's just take a moment and walk us through um, the first moment there in the hospital and and why you say that was um, a turning point or a decision point for you, Bruce. While I was in the hospital, um, I can get back, while I was in the hotel, that night, Christmas Eve, I had fallen and pretty well cracked my head open and was bleeding profusely and, and Brooke and Julie knew what I was doing and were concerned and that I didn't care and so they called and did the paperwork for a welfare check and so the sheriff did take me to the hospital and where I spent a couple nights um, but that was a crossroads that I realized that Going down the path I was going, it was a path leading to death, no doubt in my mind. Um, Or do I change my life around, turn it around, and accept the help that I knew I needed because I had failed at several attempts Um, prior to this. I I failed trying to do it myself. Um, Our three children. Uh, Brooke, Jonathan, Hannah, and Julie, of course, um, had been trying to help me too. Um, the children even came to gather, 
together and pretty much did an intervention. And by then I had spiraled so far and alcohol had consumed so much of my mind and soul that it, it didn't help. And so I knew that I needed help if I was gonna turn my life around. So I had contacted Hazelden before because I, I knew if I was going to uh, go for help that it would need to be the right place. Um, so I called them and they said that they had a bed and I made the decision that to go to Hazelden in uh, Center City, Minnesota for recovery. Praise the Lord. That's the first step. So uh, another step for you, you said you were leaving your room mm -hmm. and you had a decision to make left or right. Can you walk us through that? Uh, the, the floor I was on, it was named Shoemaker. We had about 18 guys, and it was early in the morning, and Julie had called to inform me that she had filed for divorce and to expect the paperwork and that there was no changing her mind. She was not, she had prayed about it, and she was going through with it. And it was just before we had our morning prayer our morning devotions in this large living room with, with all the men, all the guys. And I had only been there several days, so I wasn't comfortable being in such a large group setting anyway. So um, I literally stepped out into the hallway, and had I turned right, I'd go down to the living room and begin the devotions and prayer, which happened every morning. If I turned to the left, I would have called for an Uber gone to the train station and had left for Florida and basically ran away. I, at that time, I didn't feel I had anything to live for. Um, I Then I heard a voice, I heard a voice that said, do it for yourself. And so I turned to the right and I went to devotions and prayer and made the conscious decision to stay. Oh. So then a little bit after that, as you had been spending time in the worship center. Yeah, they had a beautiful worship center and I had accumulated six devotional books um, from the bookstore and I was reading those every night and it fell upon me that I felt the presence of the Lord. I was by myself. I went to my knees. And it's then that I realized that my heart and my soul and my mind only had so much capacity. And as alcohol had invaded that space, what had it replaced was my love of God and my love of my family. And so I asked God to remove that completely, and I completely surrendered my life. I said, Lord, just take me. I can't, you can't do any worse than I've done. Um, and I literally felt his presence. I felt any desire or craving or for alcohol leave, and I felt both a cool and a warming sensation at the same time. A, a cooling sensation in the comfort of, I don't need alcohol, I didn't want it. it. I was repulsed by it. And the warmth of that love of my family and God filling that void. Well, so that was a big moment for you, and you saying to me, too, it just was like this hole in my heart had been filled by God. Prior to that, I was in a lot of pain. Uh, that was daily, um, and it had gotten bad enough that I, I was barely making it from the couch to get to the restroom, not because of alcohol, um, but because of my, I had no knee. My knee had disintegrated completely, and because of all of the other um, health issues that had literally taken over every muscle tissue in my body, um, we had several failed attempts at getting a knee replacement, 
because the surgeons were certain that in the condition my body was, it would mean uh, absolutely mean a, a infected knee and amputation. Um, one of my conditions that developed over time as my alcohol consumption increased, um, I felt a literal hole in my heart, physically felt it. I told Julie that I have no doubt I'm dying. I can feel the hole. It's, it's a physical feeling to me. Um, my, my days are numbered. Um, and it felt, you know, I, you know, when you say soul, I don't know where in your body your soul is, but it felt like it was the same location. Mm. And that changed that night at the worship center? That, that sensation completely went away. It completely ended. And the journey that began that evening, the absolutely miraculous journey, included physical healing. Physical healing that was so obvious to the people who had, the guys who had seen me come in to the facility, um, talking about it, hmm. recognizing it. Yeah. Well, so last week, if you remember the message from last week, I quoted from this guy named Steve Etner, and he says, I do what I do because in my heart I want what I want. I cannot change my behavior until I first change my heart. And so you just see this humility here of saying, God, I don't want to do this in my own strength anymore. I got to surrender this to you. And you literally felt him begin to change. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, for you, Julie, you had some moments as well. And so um, there were three specifically. Um, and so one of them was viewing alcohol um, as a mistress in Bruce's life and how that perspective caused you to to maybe uh, give a little more grace in working through uh, the situation. Um, there's also the divorce papers were getting lost. And so, and then the other one was watching this genuine validation period. And so, um, start to, I guess, unpack some of that for us. Um, so, um, in my counsel with Russell, which God used him in tremendous ways, I just have to tell you that Russell for both Bruce and I and I brought my tissue because I will cry um, I never looked at the alcohol as being his mistress that had never even crossed my mind and um, when you looked at it that way and Russell said to me well who is Bruce Mealy without alcohol and what if the mistress is dead what does that look like because at that point Russell knew that I was planning to file for divorce um, but looking at it that way was totally different and it would not, I could not the, the words just kept spinning in my head um, what if the mistress is dead what if the mistress is dead um, and it did give that time so do you want me to go on to the divorce papers? well yeah, so <laughs> it did buy some time yep. but there were some things that were out of your hands yes. and that divorce papers were on their way or somewhere on yes. their way to Bruce. So God um, has a sense of humor, right? So um, the divorce papers were um, filed and sent, and that's when Bruce was saying that um, he knew that, and was he going to choose right or left? And um, we waited and waited for those divorce papers to actually arrive to him, and they never arrived. And um, nobody knew where they were. Our, my lawyer didn't know where they were. Um, there was no scheming behind it, but they were gone for almost a month. So when did they show up? They showed up on Valentine's Day. <laughs> now, we talked about this Friday, the enemy can use things because, and I'm speaking for Bruce, but in his mind, he thought I had planned that. You know, because the enemy wants us to doubt and um, stir things up, as we all know. And I had no idea where the papers were. I 
nobody knew where they were. We figured that they were just literally lost in the mail. Um, but what that time did was it helped me see the change in him and see that spiritual growth and healing in him that in the beginning I wasn't willing to give him. And as you said this morning, what the enemy used for evil, God yes. can yes. use for good. That arriving on Valentine's Day was very difficult to receive, but it allowed uh, God to work in and through you guys. Are you going to submit to him or, or not? You had to work through that. And um, it was in that conversation that Bruce had asked, can you just give me time while I'm at the treatment center and, and give me time to change? And there was something that you had gotten to a place where you said, okay. Yes. And so at that point, the Lord used that even showing up on Valentine's Day. Yes. So that began then the genuine validation period yes. where you started to see change yeah. in Bruce. And I missed him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually remember the day that I said, I miss you, you know, and two months before that, I didn't think I would ever say that. And so, yes, God allowed that validation period. And Bruce had asked um, that I take a special family class um, through the Hazelden program, which helps walk through um, the control of alcohol and what it does to your mind and um, how we were to um, interact with that. And God used that also because that was very life-changing um, for me. It made me look at things very differently. Um, and just all of those, those time gaps and those times of, of that genuine validation. Because um, Russell had asked me the first time we met if I thought I needed a validation period, and God allowed that validation period to happen. So trust was beginning to be restored by God's grace. If you remember that passage in uh, James 4, God gives grace to the humble. And so you're starting to see God at work as you're leaning into him and you're submitting to him. Bruce, after your treatment in Minnesota, you decided, I think I need more. And um, so there was treatment that you could go to down in Florida. And you thought this would be helpful as you continue in your journey. And so you move to Florida um, and then you find a church there while you're there. And then you serve on the tech team running the camera and, um, it, you know, they have sign-ups for small groups, like, what, twice a year, you said? Twice a year. And it just so happens, you know, like, people are signing up, things are getting filled. You're sitting at the camera going, there's probably not going to be any small groups for me because they're all going to be taken up. So when you finally got there to sign up, you said the topics were biblical prayers, which <laughs> didn't necessarily resonate for you. No. And then the other one was family matters, which was for, like, parents with little kids and you're like that's not me but you knew you had grandkids so maybe this would be helpful in that and so you ended up signing up for both because you just knew this is what I need to do I need to get into a community of people that uh, can encourage me in my faith journey uh, but speaking of humility it took humility for you to eventually reveal to that small group um, your past and the reasons why you were in Florida and it takes humility to sit in front of a congregation of people that you've known for decades and um, to share with them your journey as well. Uh, what would you say to someone who might be listening right now that they're going through some things that are secret, but they know they're struggling and they know that they're in need of help? What would you say to that person right now? If if you're struggling, if you're questioning, do I have a problem? Or You do. You have a problem if you're thinking that way. Um, that does mean that you, you do need help. And it's okay to ask for help. Um, Hazelden, Hazelden Betty Ford's got an extremely good success record in it, and it didn't take long to see why my greatest fear when I was there was those 18 other guys. I'm not a social group type person and I'm a bit of a germaphobe. And so that's wasn't a comfortable environment, but the, those 18 guys really were my recovery. It was 18 people who 
knew what I was going through and I could be totally transparent with because I was in a room of 18 guys that didn't have any rocks to throw because they all lived in glass houses too. And to this very day, um, every night at eight o'clock, we have a virtual AA meeting. And those same, that same brotherhood um, is on, every, a, a good number of them is on every night from across the country. And so you need that kind of support. You, you need that environment. Um, I'm, and it's worth it. Um, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I'm almost 60 years old, and it is so worth it. At almost 60 years old, I am absolutely confident that I have the best years of my life ahead of me. Mm. Amen. Amen. So part of the best years are ahead. If you remember last week, I said, God's been at work, and he is preparing our church for some freedom ministry. And these two are wanting to jump in and be a part of that to help people. And so it's actually, we met on the 28th of April, and Bruce sends me his devotional from his AA book. And it, it says this, here's the thought for today. We're so glad to be free from liquor that we do something about it. We get into action. We come to meetings regularly. We go out and we try to help other alcoholics. We pass on the good news whenever we get a chance. In a spirit of thankfulness to God, we get into action. The AA program is simple. Submit yourself to God find release from liquor, and get into action. Do these things and keep doing them, and you're all set for the rest of your life. And then the question here is, have I gotten into action? And so as it walks you through this, you guys know your next step here is to help us get some of that freedom ministry going. If there's anybody, as you're sitting here right now, or you're listening to this, and you're going, I need help, there's a mistress by the name of alcohol in my life, then I want to encourage you to reach out to somebody. You cannot do this in your own strength. And Bruce and Julie have told me they want to help people. And so if that's you, I want to encourage you to have the courage to reach out to them and to connect with them. And um, I close with this. Is there anything in closing that you would like to say before we wrap up our time? I knew that. <laughs> um, I think the one thing that I want to say um, at the Thanksgiving service, um, there are many of you that were probably there, and they didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. But God is faithful. He is always faithful. And never, ever lose your sight on that, that he will walk you through anything, the darkest of days. And he wins because <laughs> we have his authority. I guess I'd just add that my family, Brooke, Jonathan, Hannah, and of course, Julie, have been, I, I probably would not have taken that step without their efforts and continued efforts. And that is the perfect example of how alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And you need to be aware of that. And Pastor, Pastor came up, he started me in a Bible study immediately, and Pastor Russ came up, drove all the way up to Center City, took me out for lunch, and beyond his obvious support, brought me back, and the guys right away came up to me and said, who was that guy? And I said, that's my pastor, Pastor Russ. Oh, I thought you went to church in Iowa. I said, I do. So... Just thank you to all that I mentioned. Praise the Lord. I want to share one verse with you before we close this time in prayer. It's from Galatians 2.20. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. You cannot do this life on your own. God opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. Would you pray with me as we close? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you are doing right now in the spiritual realm. Father, there is victory taking place in people's lives. There are people right now that you are convincing by your voice it's time to get help. And this can be in any area of our life. We try to do things in our own strength, but Lord, you oppose the proud and you give grace to the humble. And so, Father, I'm asking that you would minister to each and every heart. And may we recognize our need for Jesus. And if there's someone listening right now that as Bruce was talking about his moment in the worship center where he surrendered his life to Jesus, you can do the same thing. And if you'd like to do that now, I invite you to pray with me and simply say, Jesus, I surrender all. I give my life to you. I cannot do this journey on my own. I need you to help me, to guide me, to lead me. And I'm asking for forgiveness of my sin. And I pray, Father, that you would cleanse me, make me new, and fill every area of my life that's been this void of things of the world, things of Satan's playground, and fill all of these voids with the presence and power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And help me to live for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? Awesome. Let's sing.